jointly administered by New York University. It is the only competition that gives high school students from around the world the opportunity to engage in written and oral debates on issues of public policy. The contest is open to all schools, public and private, for free. This year was the largest in contest history. 311 teams representing schools in 26 countries and 33 US states submitted qualifying round essays on the topic resolved. Government should provide a universal basic income. Judges reviewed these essays and selected 64 teams to take part in our single elimination written debate tournament. Each team was paired against one another, assigned either the affirmative or the negative position, and then volleyed papers back and forth via email. This process continued for several months as judges narrowed the field from 64 teams to 32 to 16 and then to the final eight teams. Our elite eight teams have traveled to New York this weekend on an all expenses paid trip as guests of the Brewer Foundation. Throughout the morning, the team supplemented the written scholarship they've produced over the last seven months with oral advocacy, competing in a series of one-on-one -on -one debates. At this time, we would like to take a moment to recognize these schools. Our quarter finalists are Grand Oaks High School of Texas, <laughs> West Anchorage High School of Alaska, <laughs> Capel High School of Texas, <laughs> and Damien Memorial School of Hawaii. Our semi-finalists this year are Hamilton High School of Arizona, and Davison Academy of Nevada. Congratulations to each of these six teams. Competing this afternoon in our final debate will be Ivy Bridge Academy of Georgia. The team is coached by Dr. Michael Hester. The team will compete against Westwood High School of Texas, the team is coached by Dominic Henderson. At this time, I'd like to invite our debaters to please introduce themselves. Um, hi, I'm Eric Hugh from Westwood. Um, I'm a senior, and I'll be the third speaker for the affirmative. Hi, my name is Ayush Tripathi. I'm also from Westwood. I'm a senior, and I'll be the second speaker. Hi, my name is Ethan Andrew. I'm a sophomore at Westwood High School, and I'll be the first speaker. Hi, my name is Anya Vidella. I'm a freshman at Lambert High School, and I'll be debating for Ivy Bridge. My name is Rakil. I'm a junior in high school at Alliance. I'm Gene. I'm a junior in high school at Columbus High. Let's give these students a round of applause. <laughs> and now to introduce our distinguished moderator and judges. Our moderator for this round will be Mr. David Baker. Mr. Baker is the Director of Admission and Financial Aid at St. Mark's School of Texas. Prior to taking this position, he spent 16 years teaching public speaking at the school and serving as coach of the St. Mark's debate team. Under his direction, the St. Mark's Debate Program was named one of the 10 most successful programs of the 20th century. Mr. Baker was elected to the NSDA's Hall of Fame in 2003 and to the Texas Forensic Association Hall of Fame in 2006. Commissioned following his retirement from debate, the Baker Cup is awarded annually by the National Debate Coaches Association to the nation's most successful high school debate team. Mr. Baker is a member of the IPPF Advisory Board. Our judges include Mr. Miha Andrik. He is an international communication, speech, and debate teacher, philosopher, and sociologist based in Slovenia. He is currently the director of Educational Center Argument, an executive board member at International Philosophy Olympiad, and a board member at Dialexicon. In the recent past, Mr. Andrik was, among other things, the director of the National Debate Organization Slovenia and a board member at IDEA. He has served as program director of several international debate academies, including YAV Africa, DSA Russia, and ESU Turkey. <laughs> Mr. Will Baker is the director of the NYU Global Debate Program. He also serves as chief strategy officer for Baker Consulting Associates based in Dallas, Texas. As a student at Cornell University, Mr. Baker won over 100 speech and debate awards. After Cornell, Mr. Baker worked at the International Association for Religious Freedom before becoming a social entrepreneur. 
He founded both the New York Urban Debate League and the Malcolm X Prison Debate Initiative at Rikers Island. In 2003, as head of NYU's policy debate team, Mr. Baker became the first African-American director to win the national championship since 1935. Since then, Mr. Baker has overseen top national finishes for nearly 20 years in a row. Mr. Baker is a member of the IPPF Advisory Board. Mr. William Brewer co-founded the national litigation firm of Brewer Attorneys and Counselors in 1984. Since that time, he has earned a national reputation as one of the most successful lawyers in the United States, practicing exclusively in the field of complex commercial litigation and dispute resolution. Ms. Brewer is also founding partner of the Brewer Foundation. A former debater himself, Mr. Brewer helped found the IPPF and now leads its advisory board. He's also the founder of the Brewer Foundation Future Leaders Program. Many of its students are here today. The FLP is a public-private partnership that provides academic resources, mentoring, and leadership training to students from the Dallas Independent School District. Mr. Brewer has previously been named Communicator of the Year by the National Speech and Debate Association. Dr. Sarah Cohen is a social demographer and associate professor of sociology at New York University. She is also the founder and executive director of the Cash Transfer Lab, which examines the impact of cash transfer policies on American families and communities. Professor Cohen has researched the effect of annual permanent fund dividend transfers in Alaska on childbearing and reproductive justice. She has expertise in American fertility, social networks, and survey methodology. Prior to joining the NYU Department of Sociology, Professor Cohen was a Robert Wood Johnson Health and Society Fellow at Columbia University. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, Ms. Christina Phillips is the Director of Debate at Notre Dame High School in Sherman Oaks, California, an NDCA board member and a member of the Policy Advisory Committee for the Tournament of Champions. Her students have reached the elimination rounds at many leading tournaments, including the NSDA Championships, NDCA Championships, and Tournament of Champions. Ms. Phillips was a four-year CETA NDT debater at the University of Southern California. Along with serving on the IPPF Advisory Board, Ms. Phillips is a longtime member of the IPPF Topic Selection Committee. She coached the 2019 IPPF World Champions, the 2011 second place team, and the 2010 third place IPPF team. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for our distinguished judges. Finally, a quick reminder to please silence or turn off your cell phones. And with that, I will turn things over to Mr. David Baker. Good afternoon. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, it's a reminder of what I'm sure Mr. Baker told you, that uh, you can uh, extend any thanks. And I'm sure there's a lot of folks that contributed to you being here. And uh, you want to be sure and thank all of them when you get home in person. Uh, but you're welcome to do that. It's, it's live streamed. We'd like to keep the debate flowing after those remarks are made. So if only one of you would do that, that'd be great. Okay? All right. Let's start with the uh, eight-minute speech from the affirmative. We ready to go? Um, yeah. Judges ready to go? Well, then let's go. Before I start, I will do a few thank yous. First, we'd like to thank the Brewer Foundation and NYU for making all of this possible. The planning, time, and consideration put into this is immense. And for all the judges who took time out of their personal and professional lives to adjudicate this high school debate. I'd also like to thank the Westwood debate team, Ayush, Eric Zhu, uh, Pranav, Eric Gong, and the rest of the policy debate squad, Ishan, Sahil, and Madhavan. Working with all of you has been um, great. You've made a huge impact on my life, and it'll be bittersweet to see some of you go off to college this year. I'd also like to thank Mr. Henderson, our coach. This is our team's first year at IPPF, and he introduced us to the event and gave us a lot of guidance on arguments and ideas, and it really turned the trajectory of our dying debate program around, around after the pandemic and made all of these opportunities possible for us. And for that, we are forever grateful. Lastly, I'd like to thank my family, my mom, dad, my sisters, who are supportive and have made all these trips possible. With that said, I will give the first affirmative constructive. 
Around the world, billions of people fail to reach their full potential. They lack education, healthcare, and housing to contribute as citizens, workers, and entrepreneurs. We live in an age where governments suffer from a fundamental misunderstanding that there is always a trade-off between helping people and growing the economy. In 2017, the Rand Corporation conducted a study on poverty in Los Angeles, and at the time, the city was experiencing an all-time surge in homelessness. Over 57,000 people didn't have a bed to sleep on, access to a hot meal, or a provider for medical emergencies. Rand poured millions into research and found that it is more expensive to let homeless people starve on the streets than to provide them with free lodging and welfare. When people were given a second chance, they were extremely likely to get back on their feet, seek a job, recover from illness, and abide by the law. Around the world, billions of people cannot reach their potential because of this, and for that reason, Rand's research tells us a simple truth. When everyone is given an opportunity to learn, work, and participate in democracy, we all benefit. Thus, we affirm, governments should provide a universal basic income. First is terms and conditions. A basic income is easy to and feasible to implement. Its funding structure could be composed of taxes on automation, value-added taxes, income taxes, deficit spending, reductions in subsidies, and resource wealth. All of these funding mechanisms are progressive, so they would not negate the, neg the effects of a basic income for anyone except the most rich. If welfare is cut, those cuts would only be a small part of the program's funding to ensure that poor people still got more. Additionally, the revenue provided would be scaled to each country. In developing countries, little payments make a big difference. As Paul Segal, a PhD in economics, writes, a basic income of just $34 a month caused global poverty to be halved over six years, even accounting for lost revenue in countries with resource revenue below the average 6% of the GDP. Governments would plan the program with long-term stability in mind and could adjust spending to account for changes. With that said, contention one is stability. Our economy isolates people from the society, setting them up to fail. The Washington Post finds that inequality closely correlates with crime rates, drug abuse, incarceration, domestic violence, and physical and mental health, which together cost billions upon billions of tax dollars. People live paycheck to paycheck, skipping meals, constantly fearing of unexpected expenses, and can see their life torn apart at any moment. When forced into this situation, people make bad decisions. Many criminals, such as drug traffickers, risk time in prison and death for less than a minimum wage. It is only natural that when people's families will starve, they resort to desperation. Without new opportunities, this cycle of violence, incarceration, and poverty will only continue. This year, 712 million people will live in extreme poverty, an increase of 23 million people compared to 2019, as climate change, automation, pandemics, and geopolitical disasters will all hold progress back. Traditional welfare is paternalistic. It is only given to a subset of the population who are described as welfare queens and humiliated. It's removed when people try to work and often does not reach the most vulnerable. It requires bureaucrats to look through your life and give you advice on how you should live. Only a basic income builds societal trust and lets recipients decide what they need most without threatening people with crushing poverty. A study in Finland found that basic income increased trust in their own future, their fellow citizens, and public institutions, lower level of stress, and improved mental health. The evidence is conclusive that when people are given a genuine chance, they don't waste it. In Kenya's Give Directly program, the crime rate dropped by 42%, while bad habits like drinking and smoking decreased. Money was overwhelmingly spent on education and healthcare. And in India, researchers found that people overcame traditional barriers, such as the caste system, and were more likely to help people from outside their traditional community. However, restrictive welfare accessed none of these benefits. By giving people the financial freedom to participate in charity, voting organizations, and build a base for progressive welfare policy, governments can become more capable of addressing emerging threats. The most important reforms require sacrificing short-term gains, which can only happen when people view the government as legitimate. When the next pandemic happens, governments will need to be popular again to implement costly quarantines and cancel social services. To combat climate change, they'll need to reform the economy, often at the expense of short-term growth, to reduce emissions. When people are dependent on their jobs for income and unable to adapt, they keep the economy from transitioning. An economics graduate from Oxford University finds that more and more, we hear calls to throw sand in the wheels of technological change. Populists who campaign on restricting technology and trade are becoming increasingly appealing for workers scared by unemployment from outsourcing and automation. As a result, countries are increasingly raising trade barriers like tariffs, while technology like AI is being underdeveloped because of fear of backlash. Our global system is becoming inefficient and backwards. 
Tensions over trade prevent mutual understanding and cause fights, preventing international cooperation. Contention two is stagnation. The global economy faces a demand crisis. When money enters the economy, it inevitably accumulates in the hands of a few wealthy people. According to Oxfam, the richest 1% captured around half of new wealth over the last decade. Total spending in the economy drops during recessions as people lack savings and income to fall back on. Dr. Pettis, a professor of finance, finds that volatile spending deters businesses from using huge amounts of cash they have towards expanding production. The biggest predictor of whether one will be rich is not how hard they worked, how much they've learned, or how smart they are. It's how rich their parents were. Our economic system is both brutally unfair and inefficient. When opportunities are unequal, only a tiny portion of the population are able to try their ideas and compete for high-ranking jobs. For every Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, there are 20 equally hardworking, intelligent, and capable people out there who were born in communities ravaged by crime and low opportunity. We will never see what businesses or technology would have invented thanks to the crushing hand of poverty. A basic income would be the bedrock of a fair and vibrant economy. First, it would ease the job transition. Businesses would offer lower wage training periods while employees would take opportunities and offers to gain experience and promotion to full-time work. Second, a basic income upgrades the workforce, giving money to afford education and healthcare. People would take on more hours or become employed for the first time, bolstering the economy. This is especially important with automation, which threatens to reduce demand and displace middle-income workers. By making workers better, the economy becomes more productive, capable, innovative, and equitable. Third, it would increase business quality by providing entrepreneurs with enough money to experiment and fall back on if they fail. By giving everyone an opportunity to test their ideas, a basic income would open our economy to new perspectives, which would allow for new, innovative business models. In conclusion, poverty is not a necessary evil in this world. It's a choice that every government makes by letting wealth accumulate. We cannot let this continue if we want progress as an equitable, fair, and just society. We must rethink how we redistribute wealth to give people a real economic and political place in society. Providing a basic income does exactly this. It builds a common community while preparing our workforce and economy for the future. Before I start my speech, I want to start with thank yous. There's a lot of people who made it possible for us to debate all the way up here at NYC. First and foremost, we'd like to thank the Brewer Foundation, NYU, and the judges here today for making it possible on IBPF side. And we'd also like to thank, thank the parents who came with us and Miss Sue for making it possible on Ivy Bridges side. And of course, thank you to our team. I see you all sitting over there. You did make this possible for all of us. We'd also like to thank our coach, Dr. Hester. He's the one who stayed with us in those late night studies, not study sessions, work sessions to make it all uh, possible. Finally, thank you to our opponents. We would not be able to debate here without you. With that out of the way, I'll start time on my first word. Our case against the resolution argues that a universal basic income is not a desirable solution, ineffective at resolving those problems and doing more harm than good for societies. <coughs> to win this debate, the affirmative must prove that the best option is universal cash payments, i.e. that UBI is a better policy option than opportunity cost alternatives for resolving identified harms without creating more significant problems. As a report on UBI by the Foundation for European Progressive Studies makes clear, the debate hinges on whether UBI or expanded social policies should be prioritized. There is thus a choice to be made between basic income or alternative social policy reforms. Our negation of the resolution will both specifically indict the affirmative's justifications for UBI and also advocate for superior alternatives to addressing status quo deficiencies, either of which warrant a negative ballot. First is contention one, the bad idea of UBI. It is important to note that the affirmative, affirmative misleadingly claims empirical success for UBI. Even the founder of GiveDirectly, the nonprofit responsible for Kenya's basic income pilot program, admits that a full, long-term universal basic income has never been tried, let alone rigorously evaluated. None of these cited examples are truly universal, let alone nationwide. Social and policy science PhD Martinelli sums up the fundamental problem. An affordable basic income would be inadequate, and an adequate basic income would be unaffordable. Additionally, it's unclear whether significant changes to the status quo are even needed to address poverty. Global trends dispute their criticism of targeted welfare failing to address poverty. World Vision's Global Poverty Fact Sheet from Spring 2023 documents poverty has steadily declined, decreasing from 36% of the world's population to 9.2% in the last 30 years, with the temporary spike during the COVID pandemic being an outlier that is receding as the global economy recovers. 
But even if change is needed, UBI is not the correct choice. Their inequality scenario is counterintuitive. Dispersing equal payments to everyone cannot alter existing imbalances because the haves get the exact same amount as the have-nots. An unlevel floor is not balanced by using the available concrete to raise every corner equally. It can only be balanced by directing more concrete to those areas that need to be raised so as to become level with the rest. We identify economic disadvantages of UBI. First is debilitating taxation. Existing funding schemes for non-universal pilot programs are not comparable to what nationwide UBI would entail. Multiple scholars who have analyzed UBI proposals conclude that it would require doubling tax revenue in economically developed countries. Economics PhD Hoynes and Rothstein warned that this would direct much larger shares of transfer to non-disabled households than existing programs and much more to middle income rather than poor households. While Center on Budget and Policy Priorities Greenstein goes even further, warning that it would increase poverty and inequality. Second is spiraling inflation. UBI focuses exclusively on how much money consumers have to spend, ignoring the inevitable reactions from sellers as to the prices they charge. Even if UBI has some short-term or long-term effects on productivity, the more immediate consequence is inflation. Macroeconomist Winningham explains that when demand causes the price level to rise because of low supply, the value of the UBI erodes, requiring an increase in the size of the UBI, which will then only increase the price level again. The impacts of such spiraling inflation are not only a short-circuiting of UBI's purported benefits for low-income populations, but also dangerous political repercussions. Economics PhD candidate Boone's research from the IMF analyzed 133 countries and concludes that high inflation drastically increased the risk of interstate conflict as citizens blame poor economic conditions and unemployment on other nations. These conflicts then lock in economic crises, destroying infrastructure and institutions, and trapping nations in a vicious cycle of instability. Carefully scrutinized evidence claiming UBI isn't inflationary. As already noted, their empirical examples are of targeted, not universal income assistance. And this distinction is important, as UBI transfers money to those whose basic needs are already met. Former director of the National Economic Council, Blahaus, notes that upper-income people spend proportionally less of their money on necessary expenses. Subsequently, they are less deterred by higher prices. In contrast, higher prices curb the spending of those who have little, as they can no longer afford to pay. Thus, UBI inflation exacerbates inequality, as economist Ludovice notes that the economy has more disposable income, but less consumption at the bottom of their distributions. Contention two is superior alternatives. The current global economic situation requires nuance, not a one-size-fits-all blunt instrument like UBI. We identified a two-pronged targeted approach that solves best. First, minimum income guarantee, or MIG, is a better option for alleviating poverty and inequality. It is neither universal nor unconditional, but rather means-tested, using a baseline for what level of income is needed and providing those below the threshold with the money needed to reach it. MIG can be provided per household or per individual, depending on what community standards. In spirit, it is simply the ex extension of traditional welfare systems with better funding. It's mistaken to assume that because low-income countries lack administer administrative capacity to establish and manage LGBT-based systems, it's a non-starter. But there are options. In his research titled The Case for a Global Minimum Income, philosophy and economics PhD Thomas Wells advocates for a collaborative approach stating that global GDP is more than $100 trillion, yet 10% of the world's population still live in extreme poverty. A global basic income program that transferred $1 per day from the rich world to each poor person would eliminate extreme poverty directly and at negligible cost. MIG is superior in three ways. First, it fundamentally addresses inequality, ensuring that everyone begins at the same baseline without helping those already ahead. Second, it better alleviates poverty by efficiently allocating resources to only those who need it, ensuring that they get sufficient support. In her analysis comparing UBI and MIG, researcher Fleischer summarized the conclusions of anti-poverty working groups that targeted guaranteed income, not UBI, is the best path forward to ending poverty. Additionally, global MIG spurs the same kind of economic productivity, the affirmative claims for UBI. Dr. Wells explains that a global minimum income can itself be expected to contribute to economic development in at least two ways. First, by placing additional purchasing power in the hands of large numbers of ordinary citizens, it will dramatically increase aggregate consumer demand, which may be expected to generate a corresponding increase in the capacity of the economy. Second, it supports a structural shift from a low productivity subsistence economy to one able to take advantage of the opportunities of modern capitalism. For example, more people may be willing to take economic risks as entrepreneurs if they know that failure will not wipe them out. Finally, Indian economist Bacharya notes that such initiatives are less expensive and avoid the harmful economic distortions of a UBI. 
Second, governments can target investment via grants and sponsored research to spur innovation and entrepreneurship. Executive Director of Deloitte Center for Government Insights, Eggers, explains that governments has a baked-in incentive to foster targeted innovation. Governments can benefit from innovation directly as new technologies improve services and save money. So, governments may support innovations that grow the economy or improve standards of living even when that innovation doesn't affect the government directly. Governments often find itself playing a central coordinating role in innovation ecosystems. The power of government incentives can make them keen to play a coordinating role in innovation. The use of meritocratic filters to ensure good ideas are generously funded is superior to throwing equal amounts of money at everyone, hoping that someone out there will start a small business if we give them a UBI. For that reason, we're proud to negate. We have 90 seconds to the next speech, which will be the affirmative second speech. Thirty seconds. <laughs> That's time. speech for five minutes. Ready? Yeah. Okay. A basic income builds a common community, enabling everybody in society to reach their full potential as workers, entrepreneurs, and citizens. By increasing trust in the government and others, it would prevent a cycle of poverty, violence, and economic stagnation. Welfare would no longer be a zero-sum game, so tensions among people would be reduced. A basic income is progressive and cost-effective. In the vast majority of developing countries, it could be funded purely by resource wealth and still have poverty. Developed countries could use taxes on automation income or value-added taxes, which would be extremely progressive. The basic income would more than offset in the tax for everyone except the top quartile, while everyone else would receive far more than they put in. This design will prevent inequality by helping people back on their feet, enabling them to seek job training, education, and higher income. Funding is possible and easy. We've explained multiple different studies that show the capability for a national, plentiful, and strong basic income in every country. By decreasing inequality and giving more opportunity, the government saves money. It would need to spend less on welfare and, get, and gain more in tax revenue as more people join the workforce. Finally, it would prevent people from committing, uh, from, uh, it would cause people to abide by the law and decrease public health costs, both things that cost governments a substantial portion of their gross domestic product. Inequality is increasing. The negative in ignores future trends such as automation, random shocks, and unpredictable events in geopolitical tensions such as the COVID-19 pandemic. Universality is key to the basic income. Firstly, targeting rewards poverty and punishes work. When people get beyond a certain income threshold, they lose thousands of dollars of benefits, which prevents them from wanting to seek out jobs or education, which stifles economic growth. With targeted programs, even those who want to work and don't want to live in poverty may be too scared to apply, or will stick to part-time jobs, just low paying enough to keep them in the poverty threshold. Second, targeted welfare creates political hostility between poor and rich people, preventing a common community. It stigmatizes poor people as welfare queens who profit off the work of others while making people afraid of applying for the fear of being humiliated. At the same time, it forces poor people to jump through a series of hosts, uh, hoops set by the government, which sends a signal of mistrust. Third, targeted welfare is a bureaucratic mess. Gannis, a master in data and economics, studied poverty programs in over 42 middle-income countries and found that means-tested programs usually reached half or less of the people it was intended to target. Now, firstly, addressing their economy contention. 
taxes wouldn't harm economic growth in developed countries. Uh, the basic income would be larger than the tax for all, but the top, uh, uh, but all for but the top 10% of the population. So nearly everyone would benefit, while the rich would have plenty of money. Though U.S. already has high tax rates without hurting the economy, so their contention is empirically disproven. Second, a basic income would not cause inflation. Firstly, it wouldn't be funded by printing new money, which um, means that it wouldn't increase the total amount of money in the money supply. And that's a natural limit on the amount of inflation that can still occur. Second, inflation self-corrects. The only reason that businesses can increase prices is so that more low-income people are accessing more goods. If prices increase so much that people cannot afford the new prices, then businesses will just adjust back down. The end result is that people can get more goods on balance, and this is especially true given that a basic income would make the economy more productive, as it means that there are more goods and businesses competing, so one bus a business increasing costs would be checked by others. Growth empirically shields the effects of inflation. China, they increased their money supply by 1,800%, but only saw 2% inflation. Japan kept inflation below their target despite fielding massive deficits in government spending. Third, a basic income would be scaled down on every, in every single country, a uh, developing nation, so the amount of money wouldn't swamp the economy. Citizens are blaming their governments for inflation and economic problems now. The COVID-19 pandemic and its slow recovery caused tensions between governments and increased the amount of economic populism. So it's ridiculous to say that people would literally go to war over inflation when there's no example of this happening. First, addressing the MIG counterplan. Guaranteed income fails. It still targets income, so people would have no incentive to take any job under the income threshold, as their wage would be literally zero. It would starve many businesses of work while discouraging people from joining the labor force. It would also cause backlash, as it still looks like a handout to the low-income um, households, which reinforces stigma and discourages people from wanting to apply. Many people feel ashamed for having to apply for government benefits and choose not to apply. Additionally, many people who are not living in poverty are still living below the standard of living. They lack the necessary food, resources, time, income, despite living in the most extreme conditions. Lastly, targeting is extremely burdensome as countries would have to evaluate income status, tax brackets, geographic relations, and other economic factors, which makes them prone to error in compound poverty. The innovation counter plan fails. Innovation through governments often fails empirically. Subsidies often pick the wrong winners and monopolizes the economy. When governments are allowed to help who they like, people, are uh, people who are truly more innovative will not earn more money. Governments have no capability to invest nor predict which companies will be the most successful. Additionally, many entrepreneurs have ideas but require the capital before they can build it. They need the security and safety net to take a leap of fa faith into the business world. And lastly, the most innovative ideas are trapped in low productivity jobs. Many low skill or blue collar workers have the potential to innovate, but they simply do not have the economic security to leave their jobs and start a business. Ninety seconds. Thirty seconds. That's time. Second speech from the negative, five minutes.
you don't need UBI to access the potential of reducing income inequality like they talk about. Let's begin with a global outlook of the economy in general. It's not as gloomy as they make it seem. For example, our holistic analysis indicates that global poverty is reduced from 30% to just 9%. The statistic that they cite in their case regards 2019 and the COVID pandemic, which are all anomalies. Moreover, a meta study concludes that global income inequality is consistently decreasing. Our argument is that perfection should not be the enemy of progress. Sure, there are current alternatives right now that could be more effective, but by trying to re each perfection through a universal basic income, you create unintended consequences. That first unintended consequence is our argument about cost. My opponents make the argument that there's so many other ways to fund a universal basic income. But the issue is, this is a blanket statement. For example, with resource taxes, while states like Alaska may have access to resources, other developing countries don't have access to resources like oil that can fund a universal basic income. For example, things like wealth taxes won't be effective because the richer individuals aren't existent in these developing countries. A value added tax won't be helpful because that hurts the poor the most. The poorest of poorest are the ones that spend the most in the economy, which by evaluated tax would hurt them a lot, lot more. Our argument is that taxation in general will double under a world of universal basic income. On our argument about inflation, my opponents make the argument that inflation generally will be self-corrected. But here's two specific problems with that. Number one, they don't address the fact that richer people also get access to universal basic income. If you provide money and income to every single person, not just low-income individuals, inflation is a whole lot worse than just giving income to the poorest under a minimum income guarantee. But number two, what Archetto explains in 2018 is that if people have more money under a universal basic income, it incentivizes businesses to hike prices, which means that middle and higher income people are able to be a market for larger businesses that hike their prices, but lower income individuals are the ones that get priced out, so inflation hurts the poorest of individuals the most. The second argument we talk about is alternatives, specifically in our argument about minimum income guarantee. What Professor Grovich finds and concludes is that stigma is not an effective deterrent for things such as means-tested welfare or minimum income guarantee. The reason why is that the benefits of a minimum income guarantee and welfare are so high that people are still rather get the benefits rather than face the harms of things such as welfare. The benefits of having income way above your income level at a basic needs are a whole lot better than the potential ramifications because of stigma. Similarly, on our second argument about specific targeted investment from governments, my opponents just say that government investment into startups specifically fail. But number one, our argument is that in this hypothetical scenario, it would be a meritocracy. Rather than throwing money to every single person and seeing what sticks, if you provide money to actual people with proof of concept to show that their startups are actually effective, governments are more likely to provide that funding. That's why our study concludes that just a 1% increase in federal funding increases innovation by 0.5%. It also goes through the jump in problem of short-termism, where current innovation is focused on creating short-term, low-risk innovation because private corporations don't want to lose their money, but governments wouldn't have that problem. Let's address my opponent's argument specifically. Their first argument also talks about the argument about UBI being bad and suggests that $34 a month is enough. But we'd argue that $34 a month is not enough to suffice basic needs like they discuss. For example, if you look to countries such as Nigeria, their relative living income per month is $600 USD, not just Nigerian currency, which means providing just $34 a month won't do anything to suffice the living expenses that they have to face. Specifically in their argument about inequality, Number one, we would argue that UBI makes the issue worse by leading to gradually declining wages. Not only would workers be less likely to put pressure on companies to provide wage boosts, but corporations would be able to justify cutting their wages to minimize their supply costs by pointing to the existence of a UBI. That's why Cambridge University concludes that UBI would function as a war machine for lowering wages and spreading precarious work. That's why their example of India is also not effective. That was an example of universal basic income. That was a targeted aid mechanism not provided to all of India, but only specific individuals that were unemployed. Similarly, on our argument about bargaining power, 
Number one, we would argue that UBI will not be able to reduce the automation they talk about. It won't solve the soul-destroying loss of purpose that comes from having your economic raisin stolen from you by a ton of animated metal just by providing $34 a month compared to the job loss it's created. Specifically on their job training argument, the jobs that workers would not take are not necessarily productive jobs, but rather the opposite. If someone could leave their job as an office worker for a corporation to run a blog, then that's what they're going to do, and while pleasurable, it's not productive it's not. for the economy. Thank you. That concludes the first and second speeches by both teams. We'll now start the team cross-examination process. I think both of you know how this process works, but so that our audience will be aware, uh, each of you must ask and answer one question. You can't answer two questions before your other teammates have answered one. You're welcome to jump in on the end of an answer if you think it needs clarification, but that counts as an answer. So, uh, very simple rules, and let's uh, let's start with, let's see if the affirmative has a question for the negative. Yeah, um, I wanna talk about the economy first. There are three ways to increase demand. Government purchases, transfers, and reduction in taxation. Vetting and subsidizing every innovative startup is a massive government purchase, <laughs> even if they don't transfer money directly to citizens. So why would that counterproposal not also cause inflation as well? Our counterproposal isn't that government subsidize every single company and every single startup that's trying to innovate. Our argument is under a general idea of meritocracy, they subsidize and fund funding for innovation that has merit, i.e. proof of concept. Uh, examples of that include, for example, in Georgia, Georgia, the country Georgia, they collaborated with the U.S. agency to try and get funds from the U.S. And a specific startup in Georgia was selected because they had proof of concept and their funding and their idea was a lot better than the other ones. <laughs> I'll take a question then. So, you tell us that UBI is an effective tool partly because it hands out cash instead of other forms of compensation. What reasons would businesses have to not raise prices as capitalist economics would incentivize them to do so? Um, yeah, as for the first affirmative constructive, we've identified that the, econ the global economy is demand constrained. Dr. Pettis, who has, who's a professor in finance, finds that businesses today have massive amounts of capital that are just waiting towards going to expanding production, but the only reason that these businesses are not investing is because they don't have the confidence that there is a guaranteed level of demand in the economy. When we stimulate the economy and, and give businesses the confidence that there will be um, a minimal level of demand, they will start expanding supply, and that means that they won't have to, they won't have to raise prices in response. Um, I'd like to add on to that. The capitalist economics that they've cited also are self-correcting, as we've explained in our last speech. Inflation businesses have an incentive to drive their prices as low as possible to compete with other prices because it gives them a little edge over the other one so consumers will buy from them, which means that inevitably inflation will self-correct and balance out because they try to push their prices as low as possible. I have a question for the negative. Yeah, um, I have a question. So the innovation proposal, how does it determine which proposals will be innovative in the future and which ones are not? The Georgia example seems very vague. It doesn't really cite like what technology they created, how efficient it was, how effective it was, how much money they spent, you know, the proposal failure rate. None of this is actually given. Could you explain this part of the proposal? Sure, I think the Georgia example specifically is supposed to help our argument of a global minimum income guarantee in the sense that the US or like more wealthy countries would work with poorer countries and look for actual economies or like startup ideas that need help there. I think that more specifically, we don't necessarily have to win that government funding is like the best thing in the world. We just have to win that it's better than privately funding. What Keel told you in his speech was very, very good. He said that private funding is very, very short term because they can't calculate the effects of market spillover. The reason why that's important is because that means that private funding, A, doesn't actually get merit-based um, entrepreneurship, and B, is very, very short-term, so it's not any good innovation. Comparatively, government innovation can see, sorry, government grants look at the long-term effects of innovation on the economy and can hence have more long-term projects to have A, more entrepreneurs, and B, more merit in those entrepreneurs. And to kind of add on to that, I think what's really important to delineate in this round is which proposal actually functions to give more innovation, whether it be a UBI or these specified grants. We isolate that by functioning under a meritocracy where governments provide grants to innovation that they see fit or see as being successful in the future is significantly better than just throwing money out to every single person who might have an idea, who might have a successful innovation. Negative question for the affirmative. I can take it. 
All right, I can take a question. Jumping off what Jean said, negation. In your constructive, you indict the status quo by telling us that the meritocracy is being upended by rich people helping people they like to get opportunities. If a UBI is true to its name and gives money to every single individual, then the universality alone means that you're not giving your basic income to a world full of entrepreneurs, you're giving your money to a world full of people whom you have no idea what they're going to do with it. The question is simple. Outside of an actual meritocracy like government grants and programs, how do you ensure that everyone you're giving money to gives money back to the economy through entrepreneurship? The truth is, entrepreneurs are not just rich people like Bill Gates or Bev Jezos, because all of these people started small. All of them needed an income support or a ladder to work their way up, and similarly, many of them started in their garage. So the basic income would provide this, a cash floor for every entrepreneur or someone who has an idea and gives them that starting capital to start their own business and invest. Similarly, the problems you've highlighted, like you know, not giving the income to the right people, also applies to the subsidies. Governments often do not know how to calculate who will have the most innovative product because innovation is not predictable. It is something that happens over time and randomly appears. That's the nature of the, act, of the sector. Thus, the same problems apply to the counter plan, where the basic income gives people the ability to innovate and create their own ideas. Um, if I could add on, also, universality is actually a little bit cheaper. So the vast majority of people at the top 10% of the income bracket would not actually make money because they would pay more in taxes or whatever the uh, basic income would be funded by. So it's not actually wasting money because these people receive net negative from implementing the program. The second thing is that targeting is also very expensive. Um, the study that we've cited in our past speech says that 10% of our spending on targeted welfare um, goes towards actually finding and targeting these people and that half of who we target actually gets the basic or the income or the welfare service. Um, a question to the negative? No. Um, yeah, I do. So okay. in our second affirmative constructive, we've made multiple arguments about how many people who are suffering from uh, low standards of living now are not just below the income thresholds and you know they're suffering because of random coincidences like debt, um, medical problems, paying rent. How does, does a minimum income guarantee remedy problems that are not started by income? So number one, our argument is that a minimum income guarantee still serves as a safety net for people that are just above that poverty threshold. For example, if there's an unexpected health complication that runs in the family, there's no worry of them becoming bankrupt and then becoming impoverished because there is a minimum income guarantee that acts as a safety net. So in that similar lens, that issue still gets resolved. But number two, once again, we can't look at every argument in a vacuum and assume there's X amount of people affected by this issue that we, you don't affect. Our argument is the comparative harms of a UBI are a whole lot worse than the people that you discuss, i.e., if we win our taxation argument or inflation argument. So it's very critical to compare those economic concerns. I'll take a question. So I want to switch back to the innovation argument. Your answer to our question was the idea that funds are, innovation is unpredictable, and then you started talking about targeted welfare, which is in our scenario, or solvency. So for example, with Mark Zuckerberg, he started off with a grant from the federal government to ensure that his innovation gets proposed. And the question still goes go answered. Why should we provide money for everyone that might not all have incentives to create a company when instead you can target that money or do federal grants where you decide on it based on meritocracy? Although some people do receive subsidies from the government and that's how they got their way up, not everyone starts off the same. In the same way, there's many entrepreneurs out there who are trapped in unproductive jobs, work that they don't like, or things that they would rather not do. And so by giving them the safety net, they can make the switch to entrepreneurship or enter the business world with the starting capital in order to innovate and make their own ideas. Yes, they're innovators now, but the question is, how can we lock the world's true potential by giving everyone the chance to create their own ideas? Can I ask a quick follow-up to that? Yeah. Um, your argument about full potential, once again, it's all semantical. You're just saying that people have potential. So if you give money to everyone, all those people have potential. Do you have quantifiable numbers as to how many people are pursuing this idea of entrepreneurship that are unable to because they don't have money? Um, there's many studies like Namibia and in Kenya, which both cite an increase in business growth and entrepreneurship. However, of course, there hasn't been a basic income in an entire nation. But there are multiple studies that do support the idea that people want to pursue things like business growth or entrepreneurship. Um, also, I searched it up. Zuckerberg did not receive a grant from the federal government. I, I don't know where you got this information from. They received 
that he received a sub D for his innovation. It's called the Civics Grant Funding. It was the funding he used to implement his electronic administration of Facebook. After he made, After Facebook. He made Facebook. He didn't have it's, the starting well, capital to begin. No. Well, this I don't know why we're having about Mark Zuckerberg, but also, it was. Just, no, oh, because okay. it's a startup. You don't immediately innovate a company after. But the it's point gone. is, many people do need the capital to start the business in the first place. But one of the worst parts about this is that the constructive made an argument that it would monopolize the mar the, the market. Basically, con uh, companies that are currently established and currently have success in innovating, you know, in the past, are more likely to receive funding from the government rather than people who are really taking a risk, really having an ability to um, create something new. So when the government goes in and subsidizes companies that already earn hundreds of billions of dollars, all the other entrepreneurs will be less able to sort of compete with these uh, conglomerates. They'll be less able to enter the market. This is worse for innovation. Can I have a follow-up? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I actually think it's significantly worse in your world. The difference between a government-funded program and a privately funded program is that private firms do not have the data or the profit incentive. They don't care about the entire economy growing. They care about their firm getting more profits. The reason why that's important is because that means they're a lot more likely to rely on past empirics of people who've succeeded in the past to decide who to fund for the future. Specifically, that's why we're arguing for government-funded programs. Though they care about the economy as a whole, which is why they're much more likely to fund more long-term plans as we mentioned earlier. Okay, so this is also wrong. Governments do not, like bureaucrats do not care about how good the economy is, is doing. They get paid because they were hired by someone else. They do not get paid based off of success. Companies do get paid based off of success and how much they can compete with other companies, which means that they are forced to, but governments and the people who give out subsidies are not. Remember that they have not provided a single example that is real about how the government has subsidized innovation before the company actually became, you know, this huge billion-dollar company. I haven't heard a question in a while. Does someone have a <laughs> someone have a question for uh, someone on the other team? No, that was a good exchange. We'll let those go, but uh, maybe maybe time for a few more questions. We've got about a minute left. I think this. it's y'all's question. Yeah, sure. I, I guess I just want to, you know, pragmatically figure out exactly what this counter plan does. So would everybody just submit a business plan proposal and then the government will vet all of them and make the determination? How will that process work and what evidence speaks to it? So all the evidence goes. I can take a question. So there's already things such as federal grants for innovation and startups right now. For example, if you look at the US Small Business Administration, they have applications open for small businesses to submit their proposals and then whatever small business the US government specifically thinks is necessar necessary, they provide grants for that. So the application process of that already exists and the foundation of that exists. Our argument is all of those are all kind of small scale and fractured. So if you make the argument, if you make the proposal more streamlined where instead of using all the money that you talk about from a universal basic income, if you funnel that into federal governments, which do by the way have an incentive to increase That's innovation smart. in the economy, that allows for innovation to boost better. Okie dokie. Guess what? Now the panel will have an opportunity to question the contestants. Um, we're going to do this for 15, maybe 20 minutes, okay, until they run out of questions, whatever. <laughs> Captains, you did great. The, one, the less I'm talking, the better this debate's going, okay? So if you'll keep your, you need, everybody needs to answer questions, right? So we don't have one person dominating those. Remember that if someone jumps in, that's also an answer and it may limit what you can do later, all right? So with that said, panel, your questions. I just wanna jump in first and just ask a question while I think the discussion of innovation is interesting, I would like to actually understand why targeted versus universal is so important, as well as cash transfers, um, but targeted versus universal. So really from both sides, why is universal the most important thing? What is the distinguishing factor versus more targeted programs? Um, Start with the affirmative. Go ahead. So there's a few reasons we've isolated. First is that the stigmatization of welfare. So many recipients feel very ashamed and feel like they'll be blamed for leeching off of society if they take the income because it's only them. 
many people want to hide it from the community or don't want other people to know they suffer from financial issues, which is a huge reason people don't go to food banks or get SNAP. In fact, over double, double the amount of recipients that get SNAP currently actually qualify for SNAP but don't take it in the first place. Another reason that um, targeted welfare is much worse is simply because it's extremely complex and difficult to administer. There's tons of things that must be calculated. For example, in the EITC, which is a program that gives employment um, tax credits in the United States, there were nine forms that recipients had to fill out, and the IRS had to calculate each of those. And thus, one in six of the people who applied and qualified did not receive the EITC. This is extremely important because that is a majority, a large portion of people who are suffering from a marginalized position who will not receive that income in the first place. I'd like okay. to add. Oh. Um, so I'll answer the question more specific to the lens of you discussing of innovation. I think the first important thing to recognize is why the universal approach is flawed. They argue that by giving universal payments to every single individual, we can spur entrepreneurship. This idea is flawed because, as we state in Cross, not everybody has innovative ideas or wants to be an entrepreneur. This opens the door for a lot of this money going to people who don't need it, like the Jeff Bezos of our, our society, or people who don't have innovative ideas and might misuse it. We argue that instead the best approach is to have a targeted approach where individuals can apply for federal grants, which we advocate to expand, and that with those grants, they're able to innovate on a larger scale than universal payments, which are marginally smaller. Okay, thanks. Another question. Yes. Can I? Uh, I would just have a follow up to this. Now, 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 both teams answered the question that probably all of the judges had in mind, like universality versus targeted um, approaches. And both teams gave very defensive answers, right? We get a few points from affir uh, affirmative saying we would choose universal approach because targeted doesn't work, and here are three, two reasons. And here we got the same response. We would choose targeted because universal doesn't work, right? C could please, like, both teams give me one reason why your approach works, not why the other doesn't? <laughs> yeah, I could start. So universal is the simplest, it's the easiest, and it's the most convenient for every government to do. When they have lists of, uh, they don't have to go through people's lists of income, they don't have to do any of that other stuff. It is as easy as sending everyone on the citizens' database um, a check. And because of those low costs, because of its political simplicity, it's easy for politicians um, to explain, you know, why people are getting a basic income. And it also prevents corruption and for people to abuse the amount of money that's being used. So does that mean if NEC proves you or proves us that bureaucracy and redistributing money is not a problem, that that, does that mean that judges should vote NEC? If technicalities, that is to say, redistribution of money who is not as simple as you're telling me it is in your case, does that mean that judges vote for NAC? So there's like a few elements to complexity that are very important. So one of them is the cost of bureaucracy, but the other one is the cultural damage it does to everyone in a society. So when we, you know, call people welfare cleans, when we give it only to a specific part of uh, the population. When welfare is zero sum, when one population benefits and another gets hurt by welfare, it makes society a lot more hostile to each other. It hurts our ability to remain unified as a society. This is the other important piece that's not really just bureaucracy, but more about just a universal society. And that might come across as very abstract, but those ideas are the bedrock of an innovative economy where people have the economic security to take time off from their jobs um, and family to pursue these ideas. Let's get, let's get the negatives response sure. to this. I'll do the comparative. AF and NEG both have $10 to help five people. If we were to spend that $10 on helping every single person, then every single person receives exactly $2. That means that A, there's more inflation. It's an equally higher levy, uh, playing field of concrete, which is exactly why businesses increase their prices and is on net bad. Comparatively, if we were to help only the two people who need it the most, then each one would get $5. That means A, that's more money helping the people who need it, and B, there's no inflation because the concrete is different. When they tell you that it's more 
more bureaucratically efficient in their world, they're talking about the front end. On the back end, they themselves tell you they want to implement progressive taxation. That definitionally requires means testing requirements. You have to know who you're going to tax, and that means you have to know how much they make in order to tax them. It's the exact same bureaucracy, but just in different places. If we can win that it's better when it's on the front end, then that's a place to vote for the negative. Could I add something? Let's hold off just a second. Okay. Is there, is there, where'd he go? Oh, is that, Could we are you yeah. good? I'm good for now. Okay. Is there, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Who's next? Uh, let me jump in and change direction. I think we're going to have a whole bunch of universal versus target thing, but I want to get rid of some nonsense that y'all may claim in rebuttals before we move forward. So first, uh, to negative and then to the aff affirmative. Y'all have like, cited twice these stats about uh, poverty decre decreasing. That, that's lovely, but let's just make clear, you are not giving us a time frame or any claim that you all can solve or poverty will end, correct? We're gonna have poor people 20 years from now for you. Like, so that's just an FYI, yeah. not, a, not, not something you're claiming. Well, we're not solving for all of poverty, no. Are you solving for any poverty? You're just gonna yes. get better. Yes, yes. We're not solving for, no in our world, not everyone is not impoverished, but in our world, more people would be less impoverished. Are, are you going to go with that deeply? Like, yeah, <laughs> no, we, got, I, like, we, got, I could... we got two million less votes. I thought, do you want, do you want an explanation of that? I, I don't, but now I'm frightened. Before I was happy, <laughs> right? I'm not sure. Okay, well, we may come back to that later. Um, you all are talking about innovation, and hey, we're just going to give money to everybody. George walks up, I got an idea for chewing gum. Here's some money for George. So my question is, Regardless of when it happens at the first step of UBI, there's inevitably going to need to be some vetting of these ideas at some point in time, which runs into the claims that you are, are, are making about the problems with how vetting, vetting occurs. Isn't it true that we're going to have to, at some point in time, vet and make choices between ideas, even if we gave everybody basic income? Yeah, so the market is the vetting process for basic income. By giving everyone the money to spend and choose about what business they would want to support, what product they like the most, what service is most important to them, the market filters out anything that is inefficient, that is incapable of working, because it means that only the most successful and competitive businesses will get enough money to refinance their investments, to build, to expand more production. So that's what I thought you were implying. But what that means then is you think basic income is going to be enough to start any business idea that's viable? So not itself enough. The first thing is that it enables people to get education. It stops some of their like debt costs. The other thing is that it gives a lot of collateral. It decreases the amount of debt in the economy generally, which means that banks can be more generous for loans, and they can also loan at lower interest rates because there's more collateral to borrow against. That way, when people do have the idea to start a business, they're more able to uh, loan against some of their finances and you know, get this income. Next. Um, I have to, a question for the affirmative and another for the negative. Um, for the affirmative, you describe a wide variety of revenue sources. Can you walk me through how, let's say, three of them can be progressive if they are not taxing individuals' income? Um, yeah, sure. So. I'll start with the first one of the examples, which was um, do a value-added tax. So this is a tax that is enforced on sales. And so through basic income and a value-added tax, we would take some of that money um, and redistribute it to households who would then spend it again. So it's sort of like a self-sustaining cycle. However, rich people do spend a lot of money, and many of their products go through a long cycle. So the costs would raise substantially, and the revenue from the tax would as well. Additionally, things like subsidies that we've cited, like in the agricultural uh, sector, actually increase the amount of monopolies and bureaucracy in the sector. There's many um, companies who are getting these subsidies from countries and using it for their own needs rather than create, increase, improving the quality of food. And so by taking those away and redistributing them as a basic income, we would give it to the people who need it the most and take away from monopolies. And some others we've cited are things like wealth taxes, which I know you've um, asked not to talk about. That would be very likely. There's likely. also like automation taxes. It's a tax on firms whenever they replace human workers with a robot. We think those are also great examples of um, taxes that would help fund the basic income. But how would that be progressive? 
Um, because, well, for one, the, auto the taxes would be on large businesses who are automating at a large scale. Those are obviously concentrated towards more of the wealthy individuals, and that those revenues would be redistributed to the workers who are losing their jobs in the first place. And on top of that, the robots or the automation would not increase their wealth in any way. Uh, thank you. A question for the negative. The affirmative has brought to our attention the stigma, the humiliation, and the administrative burden of targeted programs, which results in lower participation rates than eligible population. How would your targeted program avoid those challenges? So I think there's a couple of differences between our proposal and what they're comparing it to. They're comparing it to means-tested welfare programs, which is not the proposal we're advocating for. Our argument is a minimum income guarantee, where there's people below a certain income level and income threshold in, P in a country that the country can decide what that threshold is, and you provide people money enough such that they have money to suffice their basic needs. So the reason why the stigma issue exists in welfare programs, for example, is as they discussed with EITC and TANF, mm -hmm. there's so many forms that they need to fill out, which makes it so burdensome, along with the stigma that makes it impossible and no reason for them to fill those out. But under a minimum income guarantee, if the government is providing money, specifically money necessary to suffice those basic needs, you're not going to a program and actively registering. You get that money in your mail check or wherever you get that money. So the stigma issue is a lot worse, a lot better under a minimum income guaranteed program. And how does the government identify these people? So a couple things. One, uh, the data to figure out if someone is below a certain income level exists. For example, the, a lot of bureaucratic issues they talk about, the reason why welfare is bureaucratically inefficient is because you need to isolate specific people that don't have access to food or housing. But it's a lot easier for countries and governments to figure out who's below a certain income level and then provide money to those people. So the bureaucratic issue is a lot worse. And because you're spending a lot less money under a minimum income guarantee, you're not providing money to every single person. You're providing money to people that actually need it. The bureaucratic cost, actual cost, like the government spending money to fund that program would also be a lot less. The affirmative. Mm -hmm. Do you do away with the social safety programs that exist in most countries today? So is that part of your 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 world? To an extent, but the important distinction is that whatever you know, uh, whatever funding that is not made up for with taxes will come with the elimination of what are called duplicative programs. So there's a lot of welfare programs and social safety net services that do functionally the same thing as basic income. For example, unemployment checks, housing vouchers. Those are fundamentally cash transfers that a basic income would also accomplish. And so we think it would be redundant to have those in the world of a basic income as well. Now, other things such as healthcare or social security, disability benefits, et cetera, those would not be eliminated in the world of a basic income in developed countries. So your program is just singular. You just, everybody gets over a certain age, gets a certain amount of money, and it's the same for everyone. Correct, yes. So that, that's, hence your administrative costs are less because you just mail every citizen of voting age or some other age a check. Yeah, I mean, fis that's all it, fiscal right? residents would receive the same sum of money, yeah. And you don't really care what they should use it for. Um, well, so, this, so all the research you're citing is just research into social science and econometrics and things like that where you're just saying some people will make some choices. They'll go to school, they'll innovate, they'll spend it on um, food, shelter. But you don't really care about any of that, do you? Well, no. I mean, the, the premise of You're just giving me my check. I get to spend it any way I want. Is that right? And here's the great benefit of this. Everyone no, pays... I, but answer my question. Is that, is that right or am yeah. I wrong? It's unconditional. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That's it. Simple. Got it. You have two programs, negative. You have the minute, now do you do away in this country with the social safety net that is in place? Or is the minimum income guarantee, which is one of your programs, is that a new bureaucracy on top that, that figures out how much I need? I think 
similar to the affirmative, a lot of duplicated programs like they talk about would also slightly be done away with. But the difference is the programs that are cut off in our world and the funding that you need in our world is a whole lot less than in their world. Because once again, you're just targeting money specific to low income individuals. So I think in our world, there would be more welfare programs that would exist because it requires us to cut less welfare programs or increase taxes to the level that we argue that a UBI would. Yeah, but, but, in, but you envision a new program with people sitting around trying to figure out if all the benefits I get now through our social uh, service programs brings me up out of the poverty level so that I get, and if not, then I get my MIG, right? Yes, under a world where you're under the basic income level that a certain country has set, you would be able to get a minimum income guarantee where you get the money necessary to sustain yourself and pay for those basic needs. You wanted to say something, Gene. Oh, did, so, did you get that right? Yeah, so I wanted to specify or kind of talk more about what Rakil was saying in terms of the cost. If you want to specifically compare the cost of how much a minimum income guarantee would be in comparison to a UBI, um, our study from PhD of Economics, uh, I forgot the name, but... Um, uh, it indicates that if we take into account the total cost of a minimum income guarantee, to solve the total amount of extreme poverty across the world, it would only cost $275 billion annually. So let's compare that to a UBI. Gene, just to get to my question, you envision building a new bureaucracy. Yes. Okay. And then you have another one on top of that. It's called the Innovation Center or... Is that what, did I get it right? Um, well, it's not necessarily a new, new bureaucracy. Like, a lot of the grants and innovative um, opportunities are already in place. So is it a new program that coordinates among all the existing programs? Or would you just tell me, what is it? It's a more, it's a more streamlined approach. There's numerous different agencies in the U.S. that are specifically there to support for things such as small business innovation. They're very fractured. They all get money from different agencies. It's very confusing. Our argument is... If, for example, the proposal was implemented in the U.S., that all consolidate as one. You can call it like an innovation fund where federal governments can use all that money generally and the money that we were planning to use for UBI into things such as providing funding for startups that actually have proof of concept. So every country in your world will have these two new bureaucracies that will, one, MIG, the other, innovation, direction, and support. Is that right? Yeah, in our world, there would be two new programs, and one of the programs, the bureaucracy for it already exists. If anything, you're eliminating bureaucratic costs because it's not all divided as many different programs. You're all making it one. But yes, there would be two different programs in our world. Thank you very much. We're at 18 minutes. Does somebody else have a question? Okay. We will start with the rebel C. That wasn't too bad, was it? Everybody, that was that wasn't too bad, was it? Oh, it was okay. Well, <laughs> I mean, if it wasn't, we can do it again. If it wasn't, <laughs> <laughs> something we have more uh, Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll now have our our final two rebuttals, and the negative will go first uh, for a period of five minutes, and you may begin. The foundation for European studies was correct. This debate hinges on whether a UBI or expanded social policy should be prioritized. And we have clearly articulated why providing our solution of a minimum income guarantee and innovation grants is prioritized versus giving cash to everyone. Your ballot today is the solution that favors precision instead of proximity. The blanket solution of a UBI is ineffective. The affirmative isolates that resource disparity is the most important issue facing the status quo today. But how exactly does universal basic income decrease poverty? As Anya says in her first speech, an unlevel floor is not balanced by using the available concrete to raise every single corner equally. It can only be balanced by directing more concrete to the areas that need to be raised as to become level with the rest. Giving equal payments to everybody, someone in extreme poverty, versus the Jeff Bezos' of our society is not an efficient solution that solves poverty. The affirmative solution is flawed as it attempts to bite off more than it can chew, creating unintended consequences. The first is taxation. Economics PhD Hoynes and Rothstein warn that a UBI creates larger shares of transfer to non-disabled households than existing programs and much more to middle income than poor households, greatly increasing total taxation, increasing poverty and inequality with it. 
Secondly is inflation. Macroeconomist Winningham explains that when demand causes the price level to rise because of low supply, the value of the UBI erodes, meaning as the total amount of cash flow increases and inflation increases, so too must the total value of the UBI, creating a cycle of inflation continuing into the infinite future. The third is the market effects. The UBI makes the issue of collective bargaining a lot worse because it gradually declines wages, because companies have an incentive to decrease total wages because they know the existence of a UBI, which justifies them cutting the wage supply cost um, in the long run. Plus, it's important to note that the status quo is sustainable right now. Global poverty has decreased from 36 to 9% in the last four years, which is why, when looking at their evidence, it is only specific to the years of 2020 when you had global anomalies like the pandemic and doesn't look at the holistic trend of poverty decreasing in the long run. The one-size-fits-all solution of UBI is naive and doesn't address the multifaceted complexities of the status quo problems. We identify a two-pronged targeted approach that solves the best. The first step is the minimum income guarantee, a means-tested program that provides those below the threshold with the money who need to reach it. This resolves their argument better for two reasons. The first is that it better alleviates poverty by efficiently allocating resources to only those who need it, ensuring they get sufficient support. And thus, researcher Fleischer found that targeted income guarantee will always be a better solution for solving poverty than a universal basic income. Secondly, it's significantly cheaper. You aren't spending money to everybody. And, uh, and uh, the second benefits, or the second prong of our approach is to increase gar government investments and in grants into innovation and sponsor research to uh, spur entrepreneurships. Governments can benefit from innovation directly as new technologies improve services. So they have an incentive to have these grants in place. And the bureaucratic hurdles are already solved for because these grants are being provided in the status quo, which is why, empirically, they have not responded to our evidence, which indicates for every 1% increase of government funding to innovation, it spurs innovation by 0.5%. The use of meritocracy is better than just giving money to everybody who might have an, a, 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 an entrepreneurship idea or innovation and just hoping someone starts a small business. Now, there's a clash between market vetting and government vetting. You prefer government vetting for two reasons. Firstly, Natalia, the World Bank writes that firms care about their own immediate profits. That means that their incentive is short term and based on past successes for quick profits, which is why market vetting is really bad. Secondly, the government needs to see paychecks on their investment in the economy and they have more money, which means A, they're in it for the long run and B, they're looking for radical innovation even if it takes a long time instead of hasty market driven policies that they talk about. Let's resolve the clash of universal versus targeted approaches. Targeted approaches are so much better for a couple of reasons. Firstly, throwing money at everyone to see what sticks is economically inefficient. It sounds great, but we cannot afford this massive plan in the face of inflation and taxation. Secondly, let's look at the comparative. A UBI, for example, in the US, a developed economy with developed taxation systems would require $2 trillion of funding, while a minimum income guarantee only costs $275 billion. Federal funding for innovation is still better. That's because for every 1% of increase of federal funding, it increases innovation by 0.5%. This is the only evidence that is comparative in today's round and indicates that our world is better. Secondly, a UBI doesn't eliminate the risk. Just passing the risk to entrepreneurs, to banks who need to pay for the endeavors makes lending less likely if every single person just has more money. Looking to the economic debate, they discuss various funding mechanisms, including agricultural subsidies or resource taxes. One, agricultural subsidies are key to developing countries that sustain farming and other taxes like resources are not possible in every single government. That's time. Thus, vote negative. All right, the affirmative, last rebuttal, five minutes, whenever you're ready. There are three arguments that frame this debate. One, a basic income solves trust in the government and unifies society. Second, it's good for the economy. And third, the counter plans fail to resolve the affirmative harms. Our economy is fundamentally inefficient. Instead of using resources on education, running water, and electricity, our wealth accumulates in a few hands. Providing a basic income bridges the societal divide between welfare by proving that everyone can benefit from transfer programs. This gets rid of the fundamental stigma that we have in society now. Poverty polarizes citizens and decreases trust in the government, which is critical to combat emerging threats, pandemics, Climate change, random shocks in the future will all require governmental support and trust. Otherwise, it will be rendered ineffective. An unconditional scheme increases the ability for people to seek productive, valuable, and good work. People can pursue both passion projects, charity, and trading programs, enabling them to become part of the workforce and democracy, but also combat whatever problems that they face. This will stop a new wave of populism from increasing both internal and global tensions from disrupting the trade and the global economy. Poverty is increasing. 
and will exponentially multiply as automation and geopolitical shocks occur. Secondly, it will also take a very long time to resolve. Companies will not decrease wages as the labor market is competitive, and people will still threaten to quit their job, uh, could still threaten to quit their job after basic income or work less if they did not get uh, uh, any money. Now, their evidence about inequality is about extreme poverty where people starve, which is distinct from abject poverty, which is what our evidence cites, where people don't have enough health care or education. They write that poverty is multifaceted, so measuring it as a level of income blanketly makes no sense. Now, funding is simple. Our evidence cites the average resource income of a developing country, the average income, as 6% of GDP, and finds that even, a, uh, even that large of a basic income would be enough to substantially reduce the amount of poverty. For developed countries, they could use progressive taxes, like income and value-added taxes, which are good for the budget and overwhelmingly progressive. So only the top 10% would actually lose money or lose more from the tax than they would get from the basic income. The basic income does not increase benefits for the rich because they pay more than they receive. Now, the innovation counterplan. Their evidence is speculative and has no explanation for how governments would choose the right winners. They have no explanation for how successful any of their studies would be for helping innovation and just diverted to talking about our, uh, our proposal for innovation. Their version of innovation is like Soviet Russia's cosmonaut program, which both bankrupted the country and was totally unable to solve any of space exploration. Another example, the Facebook transfer. Social media is one of the most monopolistic industries in the world, and US government blanket, blanketly granting large companies more money gives a larger economic advantage against new entrants, which prevents poor people who want to start businesses from entering the market in the first place because all of the large market players have so much of a big advantage from government subsidies. CrossX was a total disgrace. They did not answer any of my questions. What is the success rate of your program? How do you find which technology is innovative? How do you decide which ones to invest in? And how much do you invest in? What technology did your example program make? How did it benefit the economy? None of these have been explained. We did not catch an answer. The fact that these programs they cite are not working in the status quo is proof enough that it has no effect on innovation or is worse for innovation. Their study is a bunch of random numbers and, has, and they have no reason for why these numbers are correct or why you know, increasing the amount of innovation percent would actually be good for the economy. Innovation subsidies are more bureaucratic than the implementation of any other government program, especially universal basic income, which is far simpler. Governments need to manage an application system accessible for all people, find a way to project the trajectory of an innovative startup, and identify the appropriate amount of funding to give. Governments have no incentive to provide the service because people wouldn't be fired if they, had to do a bad, if they did a bad job. Now, a minimum income guarantee also fails. This was evident in Cross when they could not explain how it could resolve poverty. First, it is targeted towards low-income households, which is subject to stigma. Recipients will feel ashamed, and they'll think that they'll be blamed for leeching off of society. They'll be called welfare queens. This leads, to many of, uh, this, this leads many to not apply in the first place and also decreases government trust, which is a critical harm that you must solve for in this debate. Second, targeted welfare is complex and generates hundreds of errors. Governments have to calculate the income status, tax brackets, geographic location, current welfare benefits, other economic factors, and how much income people should get, which all increase inefficiency. This does not apply to tax schemes as governments can calculate tax data and not other factors. Now, the economy argument, they have multiple arguments that they've mishandled. Taxes would not harm economic growth. Their evidence assumes regressive schemes, such as taxes on low-income households. However, the basic income would be progressive, so it would give them extra money. And it would not cause inflation, because uh, first is that it self-corrects. Businesses would push down prices to compete with their competition. And second is that the basic income would be scaled down in country, so that the amount of money wouldn't swap the economy. If they've conceded that the UBI makes the economy more productive and increases supply, so there would be more suppliers and, not, and they wouldn't cause inflation. That's time. We want to say thank you to Mr. Baker, to our judges, and to our accomplished debaters. The IPPF world champion will be named one hour from now. The IPPF champion will take home a $10,000 grand prize and the Brewer Cup. I invite you now to join us for the reception in the Greenberg Room. <laughs>